Welcome to the Networking Across and Managing Up panel for the Digitizing Hidden Collections Symposium. Um, so we are going to go ahead and get started with our planned question. Uh, the first one we have is all of your projects involve collaborating with other organizations and institutions in order to carry out the scope of work. While some of your individual institutions may be quite large, the library and archive staff may be a bit on the smaller side by comparison to other departments. How did you all handle sharing the work across institutions with consideration for each partner's staff capacity and skill set, which may not be the same at every organization? Were there any moments where your organization had to take the lead on a particular aspect of the project or shift priorities in order to accommodate any unexpected outcomes? I can answer. <laughs> um, so it's interesting because the, the boarding school healing coalition has has grown since we originally put in our proposal in um, the spring of 2019. <clears throat> and at that time we were a staff of two and now we are a staff of five. So we were relying on our partners, um, particularly the partners at the indigenous digital archive had already digitized records. Um, and we were really relying on their expertise and in, in terms of um, preparing to write that proposal. Um, and, but now it has shifted. Now we have our own digital archivist. And so they're definitely on par with each other. And um, it's, it was interesting also working with the tribe not necessarily in, in the terms that you defined as a larger institution, but it's an actual sovereign nation. So um, working with a, a, a sovereign tribe is, is definitely a different kind of experience. Um, you know, they have their own government. And so oftentimes we had to wait for the tribal council to meet, to approve things. Um, and then they were much larger than us in that they had different departments. They had a legal department, they had a press department, you know, as we're looking to do the press release, like, um, and you know, I'm just like over here talking to this guy in the next cubicle over, right? So um, there, there was definitely a lot of differences in terms of expertise and, and size. But what's interesting is that um, it all went very smoothly and that everybody was able to work together. I think the most challenging thing was um, meeting the deadlines with, with so many different partners. Does that answer the question? I was just wondering if that answered the question. Okay, great. And to um, follow up on, uh, on what Christine was saying in Dr. Smith, your great question. So we are a, the Spelman Archives, we are a small but mighty team of two, myself and my colleague, uh, Cassandra Ware. So one of the things I found really uh, great about this uh, project particularly is we had partnered um, the archives with the Atlanta University Center Robert Woodruff Library before. And just a brief note about, people often wonder the distinction. So the Atlanta University Center Woodruff Library or AUC Woodruff, <laughs> serves all the schools in the AUC. So there's one library for the schools in the AUC, and there is an archive in, in that uh, library that documents you know, civil rights history, um, Black Atlanta history, the school's history. I think they're the official repository for Clark. And the Spelman Archives, we are actually uh, part of an academic unit on campus, uh, the Women's Resource and Research Center, which houses the Comparative Women's Studies Program and is a a radical uh, progressive hotbed of activity for students, faculty, and staff. So just a brief um, note on that distinction to say that Spelman has worked with Woodruff many times before our colleagues. And for this particular project, a project manager at AUC Woodruff was hired, as well as a um, project and digitization manager for the Digital Library of Georgia. So it was, you know, they were people specifically tasked with working on the project. And um, in terms of gathering our materials, you know, we did work up front for page count, you know, and the specificity needed for the grant. But uh, my colleagues who were the project managers at AUC Woodruff, uh, Matthew Owenby and then Aletha Moore Carter, they were wonderful in, in terms of coming over and help us physically boxing materials. And we had our students working. And um, there was a career for the pro, you know, it was a lot of different aspects, I think, that were really helpful and that our, our 
small but mighty staff frankly didn't feel overtaxed or you know that it wasn't unreasonable in terms of the distribution of tasks and labor so and i think that just went like you said to the clarity but having had the opportunity to work with our colleagues before really about you know our capacity So I can jump in now. Um, in our case, Christ Church took the lead on this project. We kind of created it, um, recruited participants, sending out the letters, and uh, came up with the framework for how to actually go ahead and implement it. And we based it on a smaller digital project that we had done a few years earlier. So we were well accustomed to working with the Regional Digital Imaging Center at the Athenaeum for scanning and working with Walt Rice, who was our IT consultant. Um, and we were very lucky in that clear funding allowed us to pay for my time and allowed us to hire a metadata archivist. So that took the burden off the smaller institutions. They would be responsible for conveying their records to the Athenaeum for scanning and picking them up again, identifying the records within the parameters that we had set, the date ranges, the types of records, and so on. I'm incredibly grateful to Nancy Taylor at the Presbyterian Historical Society who was there to help survey and also provide another archival perspective when I needed um, to kind of touch base with somebody on things. Um, some of the problems we ran into, it's kind of interesting, is that we were working with congregations who were reliant on volunteers in many cases. And some of these, of course, were older volunteers. So within the course of this project, and we are now at the end of our third year heading into that fourth extension year, you know, we've had people who have become ill or their spouses or family members became ill and caregiving responsibilities took over. But everybody was really good about sort of um, backing off and saying, oh, you know, the archivist or the historian at St. George's has just retired. How about if the Gloria Day records go for scanning this time around? And that really kind of worked well. It was those of us at Christ Church and the primary staff that also took the lead on outreach, but again, reaching out to those people um, and members and collaborators to the other congregations to join with us as we presented at public events, at events within the congregations. And um, Nancy Taylor and Walt Rice and I did um, another AASLH presentation actually last summer. So things like that um, were really useful. And we also worked hard to keep those collaborators sort of a tightly knit group with frequent emails and by um, inviting them to events with, um, to talk about project progress, preservation needs for records, um, and when we unveiled a new online transcription process in our project. So this online transcription process really helped us pivot as we hit pandemic stages and shutdowns. And, um, you know, we moved away, of course, from the scanning because <laughs> leaving whatever was on place. And we started to recruit people and volunteers across genealogical communities through our partner communities with the American Theological Library Association and the Athenaeum to find volunteers to help transcribe these records and make them even more successful. So in some ways, COVID-19 has provided that silver lining for us, even as the rest of us worked at home. Um, this is a great question. Really great to hear from everyone's stories. Um, with um, the example of Film on a Boat, um, the University of Florida and University of Puerto Rico have been talking for a while. How do we get more newspapers digitized? Um, so we're already partners um, for the National Digital Newspaper Program, um, and we're also now partners with the um, University of the Virgin Islands, so making sure that all of those newspapers can be digitized. That's fantastic. So we're slowly working our way through. We know that you know many years, many decades of projects um, work there. Um, but we have all of these newspapers that weren't from the U.S. Newspaper Project, um, and so they weren't done with the same cataloging standards and other things, and there's just so many of them. You know, how do we get them done, and how do we get so many done that are from the rest of the, um, of the Caribbean that are housed at the University of Florida? 
And so this project allowed us to envision a mass, huge scale um, working forward um, together. Um, and the University of Puerto Rico, really fantastic institution, you know, huge public serving, um, research and teaching focused, and so very aligned in terms of um, you know, abilities, capabilities, they have a microfilming center. Um, one of the things that was an impact on skill set, the microfilming um, person uh, was retiring, and at that time we weren't sure if the position would be backfilled. So thanks to the CLEAR grant that helped justify the position in order to keep it. Um, to some things like microfilm, what is that? You know, those are the a lot of people don't know anymore, um, if they ever knew. And so when you lose that gap, then it's something when you have budget cuts or austerity that can be cut. And that's a huge, tremendous loss if you're the microfilming center on an island. Um, and so making sure that that was supported. Um, and we learned so much from working with partners always. Um, you know, Digital Library of the Caribbean is committed to preservation and access and also growing capacity and community. Um, so whenever we work um, with partners, really great communication. Um, we're always in touch with Digital Library of the Caribbean, which has an executive board and scholarly advisory board. Um, so just really beautiful. This is a project, um, it's one of my dream projects, one of my career goal life um, projects, to be able to see so many more materials available for everyone. That's amazing that you were able to do a dream project. <laughs> All right, so our second question is, um, I recently attended a panel discussion of cultural heritage workers who specialize in African-American and indigenous archiving research and curation. And during this panel, they underscored the need for thoughtful archeological and historical research that respects the communities, as well as the legacies of environmental racism, racialized disenfranchisement and heritage erasure. As archivists, I'm curious about how you all were able to maintain a level of alignment and equity between the project team and the community on which your research was focused. Did they provide another level of collaboration to the project outside of the specifically defined partners? Um, were they actively involved through contributions to the archive and assisting with interpretation? Did they at any point raise any questions or concerns about the project? How were those issues addressed? And if there were no issues with the community, what preventative measures did you all take in order to avoid them? Well, full disclosure, I'm not an archivist. <laughs> so, um, but we do have an archivist on staff and um, we definitely, each partner has an archivist. So um, we, because we're dealing only with these records that are um, about indigenous peoples and they impact many tribal nations, we have developed our methodology to include um, what we call community um, listening sessions, which is really to engage with those tribal communities, both um, on a reservation and with urban Indian communities, uh, primarily um, for, for that particular reason, to get their input into the records, um, but also to facilitate their engagement, their, um, an opportunity to actually um, review the records, engage with them, tell their own stories about them, process um, any information that they may be finding about their relatives or um, the grief or, or some of the trauma that, that those people experienced, that those children experienced in those schools. Um, so there's, there's definitely that side to it, but for, for the digitization of the records, absolutely, we're asking for input. It's, it's particularly important for Native American communities uh, and especially surrounding this particular issue because these schools were assimilative and sought to erase our culture, um, to give them opportunity to have input before we make these records public. So we have um, instituted TK labels, which TK stands for traditional knowledge, and, um, and also giving the tribes the opportunity to say that something may be culturally sensitive and therefore not, uh, t should not be made public. Um, so there will be, you know, layers um, that happen before we publish the, the records on, on the um, platform for, for public uh, consumption. And um, really, you know, that gets back to this idea of data sovereignty, which I had to pull it up so that I got the definition exactly right, because it was developed at the University of Arizona. Um, it's the right of indigenous peoples and nations to govern the collection, ownership, and application of their own data. So we do um, want to uphold tribal data sovereignty um, and 
our vision at the coalition is um, indigenous cultural sovereignty, which we believe um, includes the right to set the terms of healing and reconciliation around these traumatic events around this US federal policy that impacted us and continues to impact us today. Okay, I'll jump in. <laughs> so our project is focused on getting the original records out to a wide variety of historians and scholars, family historians, students, etc. We're not engaged in research ourselves, but the records that we're making available provide that primary source documentation for the treatment of um, African Americans and Native Americans. These faith traditions um, whose records we're collecting were generally hierarchical and very methodical in the way they kept their records, um, requiring documentations of key events in life like baptisms, circumcisions, marriages, burials, and having their decisions um, codified within their vestry or trustee minutes. So um, there were no African American churches in Philadelphia until the late 18th century, when Absalom Jones, Richard Allen, and others walked out of a service at St. George's United Methodist Church and went on to establish Mother Bethel AME and St. Thomas's African Episcopal Church. Like the churches that they were accustomed to, St. Thomas's vestry and ministers kept good records by documenting those same life events and those same decisions that um, they had grown up with. Art Sudler, the historian for St. Thomas's African Episcopal, has come to a number of our uh, public events and helped provide additional context for understanding those records more clearly within um, these basis of records. But we also have within the records of those original, um, of the earlier churches, the ones prior to the African American churches, Christ Church, St. Paul, St. Peter's, Gloria Dei, records of um, those baptisms of Native Americans when they would, when the ministers would go out into like the western reaches of Pennsylvania, or the um, enslaved African Americans or free African Americans. There's actually a wonderful little notation in the records of St. Paul's um, where Reverend Pillmore has married two free blacks and usually all these marriage records are squished together on one page to save paper and they're all, th these two individuals got a whole page to themselves with a little note saying this is good. And it was like such a rare bit of editorializing, it kind of jumps out, but that's where we rely on people like Art to help us figure this out. But really our goal is simply to get the materials out there for people to um, use in their own understanding, particularly some of the congregations that are now facing historic racism in their past and trying to come to grips with it. So we hope that these records will add to that level of understanding. So I'm happy to jump in. Um, it, with newspapers, um, obviously, because they're pre-1923, so many of these are colonial imperial newspapers. Um, they're still really important because they capture the different views, you know, people at time, the, the history in the making. Um, and so these are materials that were identified for microfilming, um, you know, with um, the University of Puerto Rico um, when they were um, microfilmed, um, and the University of Florida and working with um, different nations, you know, different um, archives, libraries there. Um, so they were but important for historical reasons um, sometimes the you know those are historically important but that doesn't mean that the views are things that we would support today or sometimes they're imperial and colonial and sometimes that's really terrible um, so we spend um, so a lot of time you know talking about what these records represent um, and obviously as they're digitized and we have more time to work through them we'll, we'll know what they are um, and be able to explain and support that more for teaching and research um, and that also requires deep collaboration um, with uh, with scholars for understanding you know different periods in the newspaper's history this is what it represents at this time this is a shift you hear some of the writers that are you know 
fighting for printing press rights, fighting for all different things. And here's how you can understand these papers together. Um, with any of the newspapers from other countries, um, those are, you know, the agreement. Partners get a copy, UF gets the copy. Um, and so I have um, traveled before and like brought hard drives um, to different places. Now, normally, if people are like, hey, we need a copy here, um, we send it by Dropbox. Uh, it's just faster and easier. So <laughs> that's a lot more convenient than um, it used to be whenever I traveled to different conferences, I would have hard drives in my bag. I'm like, hey, oh, you're from the National Library here, you know, here's your hard drive. Um, but the things that will come up from the papers are more the, the gaps and the absences. This is a huge project, so much more material will be online, that's fantastic. But as soon as, as we put more online with the Digital Library of the Caribbean, what we have is, what we hear so often is like, but you don't have this, but this is missed, this isn't covered. But so it helps, you know, it's like, a giant puzzle and so we're getting some of the edges so that we can know what else we're missing and then we can figure out ways that we come together to target those. So often, um, typically HBCUs will have different concerns than um, predominantly white institutions or historically white institutions um, in terms of exactly what my colleagues, you know, described, but that doesn't mean that um, HBCUs don't have their own complicated, you know, relationships around communities, um, whether it's around, you know, <laughs> patriarchy, homophobia, anything. So I just wanted to make sure, make that, you know, distinction that the challenges are often very different. And in this particular um, case, so we're not dealing, you know, particularly around, you know, records that have been historic, you know, historically marginalized communities or often, you know, the voices are present and their materials that are created uh, by and about Black people. So th that's just a, you know, different distinction. But again, just like everybody, you know, outlined, I think, first of all, it was the idea about the breadth of the material. Certainly, okay, these are the materials that we own, and these are very reflective of the institution as well as its constituents. So I think that really led to the decision and decision making um, because we have, you know, tons of other <laughs> types of materials that could have been part of this project. But I think also in knowing that, so the uh, reception to the project, and even as we, you know, went, we had letters of support, of course, from the university. And I think that's another little bit of a distinction. It They were all, um, we didn't partner directly with a community group or an external partner in the sense that these were all Atlanta University Center related materials. But I think buy-in was really important. Um, and certainly, I'm, I'm not a Spelman alumna, but I'm honored to have been adopted as a Spelman alumna. And the alumni uh, and alumni networks at you know these institutions as well as the student groups are very strong, I think, for what they you know, historically have, have meant. So there was a level of excitement and joy and like, okay, these materials will be made available, period, because we do get a lot of requests, like you said, for people, you know, maybe have lost, misplaced yearbooks or want to know something about um, family. But in that, we also have, um, you know, takedown policies. If they're, you know, become, it become, you know, to our attention if something is problematic or, you know, and that will be done in consultation, of course. But I think in the effort of transparency too, um, to have these policies and these kind of conversations, um, again, around and, you know, thinking about, you know, exactly as my colleagues have, you know, just described, when I think of, you know, whether it's student newspapers or policies from the institution um, that have reflected, you know, like I said, whether it's attitudes of, you know, paternalist, paternalism, patriarchy, homophobia, we, you know, those are things that it exists where um, alumni or particularly thinking about uh, LGBTQ alumni could feel marginalized or harmed in any way. So just also acknowledging that transparency and self-awareness on our end as well. So um, also thinking exactly like my colleagues described, we've had a number of public events and we even had um, an event which was around helping identify uh, for the identification of photos that we might have had. So we opened that up to alumni during um, reunion weekend, which is usually held around commencement. 
And again, just to see the engagement and excitement around <laughs> the memories that start firing, oh, that's so-and-so, and that leads to that. It, it brings a lot of joy and a lot of reflection. We do work a lot with <laughs> reunioning classes. So if I'm in my office and I hear the stories firing and this happened and that, and so we really appreciate the collaborative nature of that relationship in order to you know, provide and facilitate access openly. Um, so I'm just, um, hopefully that answered the question, Dr. Smith. <laughs> I feel like I was going down a rabbit hole a bit, but I think again, um, just as my colleagues have said, you know, just wanna be really open and transparent, also for future reference, um, but really also to provide this um, unfiltered contextual access about the, the collections for research use. Yes, that definitely answered the question, no worries. <laughs> all right, and my last question is, in order to increase capacity for the project, not only did you all network across with similarly, posi similarly positioned organizations, but some of you also partnered with larger institutions or sovereign nations in the case of Christine. Were there any moments during your project where your organization had to set boundaries with a project partner or be a little more flexible or both in order to uphold the goals of the project and the mission of, the, of your organization? The same question for representing a larger institution who may have had to respect the boundary for a smaller one. Absolutely. Um, I think in terms of the focus for this project, um, everybody agreed, all our partners agreed that the Boarding School Healing Coalition should be the lead since we, we're primarily focused on boarding school records and, and truth telling of, for this era in history. And um, yet we were this, um, not the smallest institution. I, I, I think if we had to rank in order of size, we were in the middle. Um, but we definitely deferred to the tribe. Um, there were some instances where we were writing the proposal and um, they, you know, said they needed something changed and we just did it. You know, it was um, part of that respect and um, honoring their, their authority and their sovereignty. And um, although we are an organization that has a board of directors that is 100% Native American and... Um, and a lot of our coalition members are Native American, we recognize that we don't have that, that same authority as a sovereign um, and that we are really trying to facilitate what we call community-led healing, which again puts, you know, puts the emphasis on these, these tribal nations um, because there are so many tribes in the United States, each one has its own culture and language. Um, so, you know, we can't be the authority on over 500 different cultures and languages. So we rely on them. Um, and also I wanted to, uh, when, when um, Holly was talking um, about people interacting with the records, I wanted to mention also that we take great care um, when we bring these records to a community um, to uh, not only for the for the records but for the people that um, and and not everyone experienced trauma in these schools we've heard plenty of people say that they had good experiences they made lifelong friends or they met their spouse or um, they really appreciated their education but we've also heard quite a few people talk about the difficulties of being separated from family and community of being separated from their language and their culture and unfortunately Plenty of people also experienced abuse of, of many forms um, from physical, mental, spiritual, and sexual abuse. So we do have to provide a safe container for people, um, although they may interact with the records, like Holly was saying, as alum, and you know, be celebratory about those relationships and those memories. They may also be unearthing some of that trauma. And so we do um, take care to have people there to, to care for their spiritual needs and um, counselors on hand. And um, yeah, so that in that case, you know, all the partners are on the same page regarding that. And, um, you know, although there have been some challenges with bureaucracy, um, because one of our partners at the IDA is actually, um, has a fiscal sponsor, which is um, the Museum of Santa Fe and uh, or New Mexico, and so there's you know levels there that they have to go through for approval. It's that part has been challenging, I would say, in terms of getting everybody 
um, together and on the same page. And then of course COVID hit. So we're, um, you know, still at the beginning of our project and haven't been able to get out there and we're really hoping to be able to do that soon. So this is a really wonderful question. It's incredibly important because what we always want our um, our projects to be community led, you know, and community connected. That's why we're doing this. That's the only way that it makes sense. Um, with the Digital Library of the Caribbean, I, I, I met the Digital Library of the Caribbean after it already started. Um, and as soon as I did, I was like, this is what I want to work on. This is the type of way that I want to work for the rest of my life. I didn't have the right words for it then, but it's a generous community. Um, I didn't even know how to put that in terms, but um, if you attend the Caribbean Studies Association Conference, West Indian Literature, generous comes up so often, you can't miss it. Like, no, we're all in this together. How do we pull together and support each other? How do we do this better? You know, there's so much work to do. If you can do some, that's wonderful. My burden is lighter, Let, let's bring some other people in. Um, so in terms of like barriers or pro problems with partners, we expect there to be problems from our institutions. Um, University of Florida has extremely advanced bureaucracy. Um, and so you have to have some people that like, part of my work is to read, you know, rules and regulations and understand how can I make things work. Um, but one of the things that's super beautiful in this generous spirit, we also, we can't forget, we have the reminders every year um, with hurricane season, you know, and the, the mutual aid of, you know, if a hurricane's coming by and if it's bad, you know that the storm has passed when you can hear the chainsaws crank up and you'll have people walking down the streets like, do you need anything cut off your house? You know, are you okay? Everyone okay? Um, and that, that mutual aid, it's in everything that we do. And so we're always how do we support? And we're gonna have impacts. There's gonna be weather, there's gonna be austerity. Um, so it's a really wonderful question for this is how we, we all need to work. Um, and I'm extremely thankful for the Digital Library of the Caribbean for showing me. It was the first time I really saw that it was completely possible. I um, just wanna extend my you know appreciation to, again to you, Dr. Smith, and to my colleagues here, because I think these are just really, I'm excited to, you know, continue to stay connected with each of these projects because I think they're just really exemplary in what being an ethical, equitable archivist, you know, is in genuinely equitable, you know, seeking those genuinely equitable, collaborative, and not co-optive relationships. Um, <laughs> and I think that's something that behooves us all to be, you know, self-aware, not just with our personal identities or whether we're at, you know, uh, majority institutions, um, but also for, uh, you know, I've certainly been in uh, spaces where I might be the only you know, black person, the expectation was, <laughs> you know, well, now you're going to, you know, work with this community and then, you know, just, we want to help them, you know, just very, again, paternalistic uh, types of language and, and not, you know, again, coming with the project and like, here, we want you to do it in different communities instead of, you know, really. So I just want to, again, thank you for gathering us and again, um, Kim and my colleagues for their wonderful work. And again, it, it just having a, a little bit of different, different, excuse me, different implications, but on my end, being the smaller <laughs> partner um, with not, a, you know, the number of staffing in, in that regard. And I say certain resources, but again, I just really want to emphasize, I think, unfortunately, sometimes when people look at HBCUs or institutions, it's like um, we're at a deficit of you know, we're in an immediate deficit. And I, again, just want to emphasize that HBCUs, we're not operating a deficit. We have the materials, we have the expertise. We know why we're underfunded historically <laughs> often, and often that it's a matter of not having access to the exact resources. But I'm just really grateful for, you know, this particular uh, partnership, we were all seen as equal partners. Um, with, uh, you know, equal conversations. And I myself as a partner always felt a part of the conversation um, that I had wasn't marginalized anyway because we were smaller. Um, if anything, I really commend my colleagues at AUC Woodruff um, and the Digital Library of Georgia at UGA, you know, just for the collaborative nature that we could work. And then the collaborative way that I felt, you know, our voices my, uh, from the Spelman Archives and from the constituents we serve you know, being at the table in, in the beginning. Um, so I, I just felt like that was, you know, a, a really important kind of partnership. I'm very grateful right now. So the digitized collections on, on the uh, portal 
they live on um, AUC's digital content system radar. So we, you know, don't have the, the burden of trying to right now, you know, as we figure out things with our own digital repository, you know, feel like things are accessible and it's really clear, you know, to distinguish whether it's Spelman, Morehouse, Clark, you know, it, it feels like there's the genuine uh, desire for representation, but, you know, there is an allocation of resources that I have felt has been in a very sincere, transparent, and equitable way, which, um, again, I hope that answered the question, Dr. Smith. <laughs> In addition to our congregational partners, we have three uh, larger institutional partners that have been tremendous for us. They're all providing levels of um, service, but their commitment to us has gone beyond those contractual obligations. The Athenaeum of Philadelphia's Regional Digital Imaging Center has been scanning documents for us, accommodating the schedules of all the volunteers who are dropping things off holding them for weeks or months at a time during the pandemic. Um, but beyond that, the Athenaeum leveraged their relationship with the University of Pennsylvania to connect us to OPEN for long-term preservation storage for these records. They've also provided a place for us to hold gatherings and most recently hosted a virtual transcription workshop for us for their members. The concluding symposium for our project will be held at the Athenaeum, hopefully next fall, if we can all gather. And if not, I guess it will be a combination of virtual and in-person event. They've been a hub to help connect our institutions, our volunteers, and the public. The American Theological Library Association is hosting our records in their digital library. And we've had to work closely with their developers to ensure that our records are displayed properly with transcriptions attached and that they ultimately will be searchable across the records. So this required our IT consultant, Walt Rice, to work with their consultants on programming. But again, ATLA has gone above and beyond this, reaching out to connect us with their membership, um, highlighting the project through blogs. They've recruited volunteers for transcription. They invited Walt and me to speak at their annual meeting this past summer, and we're actually doing another program for them this coming week on uh, the whole transcription piece of the project. And as with ATLA, we've had to work with the staff at the Kieslack Center for Special Collections at the University of Pennsylvania to determine what was needed for our records to be shown and preserved successfully in OPEN. The folks at um, Kieslack Special Collections Libraries have just been unfailingly gracious in allowing us this opportunity and willing to expand their commitment to us as we seek additional funding because like you, we are now hearing from everybody saying, but you forgot the Moravian records and what about St. Michael and Zion? Um, all of these partners have just been so gracious in accommodating changes in our timeline and minor changes to our technical specifications. Having a very solidly defined work plan and technical standards up front um, has made these partnerships more successful because even with staff changes, each institution understands its role in the project and what is expected. Setting clear expectations early on presented, prevented us from having to set boundaries. And again, like all of you, I'm just so grateful to all of those people who have helped make this possible. And excuse me a second, doctors, but I, I wanted to make sure and mention this. Um, there is also content on the Digital Library of Georgia uh, site, our newspapers. Um, I wanted to make sure and not give short shrift to our <laughs> colleagues that are also hosting our materials. So um, they've also been a, you know, a great collaborative partner. And again, it's very clear, you know, that these are Spelman or AUC materials. So again, it, it's I uh, want to also extend a huge thank you to them for hosting some of this content as well. So that brings us to the end of my questions and we're going to switch over to the live Q&A with our audience members.